Darkest Reach, Infinity's End, Book Three, by Eric Warren. Narrated by Larry Gorman. One. It was like staring into his past. Caspian Rabot stood, facing the only occupied cell in the brig of the USCS Tempest, watching the tall man inside pace back and forth. His dark hair was unkempt, and his hard visage reflected the hatred Cass had expected, but not seen over the past few weeks. He hadn't been down here to visit Lieutenant Page since his arrest. Now that they were only a few hours from reaching Starbase 8 again, he'd figured he'd better take the opportunity while he still had it. Once he'd entered the room, Page had stood, and with a palpable sneer on his unshaven face, had locked his eyes on Cass. Page didn't say anything, only watched Cass from the other side of the force barrier, keeping them apart. He was still in his uniform, though it looked wrinkled and showed sweat stains on the chest and armpits. Cass was glad smells couldn't penetrate the force barrier. He'd managed to avoid this confrontation for almost thirty days, their entire trip from Sill Space back to Coalition territory. But as the moment of their arrival grew closer, he found himself drawn to the man who tried to betray him and his closest companion, Box, an autonomous mining robot who had been with Cass ever since his exile from the Sovereign Coalition of Aligned Systems. Cass had been off the ship when Page had enlisted the help of some of the other crew that hadn't been happy about Cass's arrival and used them to get rid of him and Box in the most inhumane way possible. It was a crime Cass wouldn't be able to forgive. "'I suppose you've come here to gloat,' Page finally said. His voice sounded raspy, as if he'd been shouting a lot. I just wanted to... What? What had he wanted? You're the one who should be in here, not me. Page stopped pacing, but kept his stare on Cass. I'm not the one who tried to illegally disassemble a life form because of his own prejudices. Page scoffed. That thing's not alive. I don't care what anyone says. It's a collection of parts built to imitate life. Disabling it would have done nothing but save some energy. Cass had known Box for over five years, and to him the robot was as alive as any organic being. He had independence of thought, full autonomy, and a sense of humor. How many times do I have to tell you we're not a threat? I didn't want to be here any more than you wanted me here. But like you... I had a job to do. If you want to hate me for trying to help, then go right ahead. It doesn't matter to me what you think. I don't hate you, Page said with the same intensity. You are a threat, and you don't even know it. A threat to the ship, and you don't deserve to be here. Anyone who violates their commanding officer's orders and then runs away has no place on a Coalition ship. Especially not when it's mine. It's not yours anymore, Cass replied, unable to keep the man from goading him. We'll see about that. Out of the two of us, I am the one who still has his rank and his commission. Just check my record. It's virtually spotless. What do you think will happen when I go in front of the review board? That they'll just dismiss me? When you picked up that weapon and tried to kill Box, you gave up all your credibility. You disobeyed an order from your commanding officer. I guess we're not that different after all. Box had told Cass about how Evie had come to his rescue, stopping Page at the last minute from shooting Box by getting the drop on him. Page balled his hands into fists. The commander didn't understand the situation. She's been compromised because of her relationship with you. The commander and I don't have a relationship, Cass said on the defense. He hated Paige for goading him, but he couldn't stand the thought that Evie was giving him preferential treatment because of their brief history together. Oh, please. I'm not blind. She never should have been the one to retrieve you from the Sargan Commonwealth. That job should have been mine. I wouldn't have been as understanding. Cass hadn't come down here to talk about Evie. He'd only wanted... What? Closure? The odds were Page was going to prison after a court-martial, just like Admiral Rutledge. Somehow, Cass was making an impact, ridding the coalition of its less-than-ideal elements. 
Was it pride he felt at coming here? At having accomplished something? Wipe that smirk off your face, Paige spat. We'll see who was laughing. As soon as Coalition Central hears my side of the story. Cass shook his head. You idiot. You don't even know what you're arguing against. Do you understand the kind of people you're working for? They won't hesitate to toss you in jail and throw away the key. Believe me, I know. You committed a capital offense. Page turned his back on Cass. I'd never put my own interest above those of my crew. What about the interest of innocent people, then? Cass said, heat rising in his cheeks. What if you were ordered to open fire on an innocent civilian ship, to capture it and eject its crew? Would you still be so high and mighty? Page glanced over his shoulder. A frown spread across his face. Is that what Rutledge ordered you to do? On a sill vessel, Cass replied. It had been a classified mission, and very few people in the Coalition had known about it, including Cass himself, up until the moment when then-Captain Rutledge had ordered him to fire on and disable the smaller sill ship so they could capture it. The mission had been to obtain the sill technology, to bring it back to Coalition space in order to reverse-engineer it, to learn the secrets of their destructive weapons so the Coalition could build its own. The entire mission went against everything the Coalition stood for. Cass had refused his captain's orders, and because of Rutledge's stubbornness, it had cost the lives of twenty-four of their crew before they narrowly escaped. There must have been a reason, Page said. He wouldn't have given the order without a purpose. Cass knew he shouldn't be telling Page this, but he'd had enough of the man blaming him. Rutledge was the face of those in the Coalition who wanted to get a look at the weapon systems, build some of their own. So, it was to protect the Coalition, Page said, by violating everything it stood for. Cass ground his teeth together. That's easy for you to say. You grew up on Earth, didn't you? Never having to worry about anyone invading your perfect home? You never woke up in the middle of the night to marauders tearing through your home, looking for fuel or food or worse. On my home world, I had to fight every day to stay alive. I didn't have the luxury of taking the easy way out. And yet you joined the Coalition, Cass said, an institution based on principles. We don't attack civilian vessels, and we don't build weapons of mass destruction. Page laughed. Listen to you. We. Like you belong to it anymore. No. We do what we need to survive. And if that means adapting to new threats, then so be it. Admiral Rutledge did what was necessary to survive. And as one of his officers, you should have seen that. Instead, you saw yourself fit to make a moral judgment over something you had no knowledge about. You were a bad officer. Cass screwed up his face. I didn't. Did you know all the facts? Or were you just going off intuition? Cass hadn't known what was going on at the time. He hadn't known Rutledge and others in Coalition Central were trying to prepare the Coalition for future unknown threats, and they were trying to do it in the most clandestine way possible. All he'd known was his captain wanted him to fire on and disable an innocent vessel, and Cass couldn't get on board, no matter the reason. Unfortunately, Rutledge's fears came to pass when Coalition telescopes picked up an unknown alien threat headed their way a few seasons ago. Somehow Rutledge had known, or at least known they would need to be prepared. The entire reason Cass had been at the last mission had been to convince the Sill to help the Coalition. Despite the fact the Coalition had eventually succeeded in capturing one of their ships and attempted to reverse-engineer its weapons, it hadn't gone well. I didn't think so, Page said. You disobeyed an order without knowing all the facts, and it resulted in the deaths of your crewmates. If that doesn't define a bad officer, then I don't know what else would. Cass wondered if Page was right. What if he had followed Rutledge's order? They would have captured the ship and begun the experiments earlier. Rutledge had revealed the entire reason Cass had been chosen to be on the crew was his extraordinary engineering experience. 
Rutledge had wanted Cass to head up the team that reverse-engineered and constructed the Coalition version of the Sills weapons. As it turned out, Cass hadn't been there. So when the weapon had been tested, it had resulted in the loss of all hands on his old ship. If Cass had been there, maybe he could have figured out how to make it work, or at least prevented a catastrophe. It wasn't right. The Coalition wasn't like that. At least he had believed that back then. He'd since discovered the Coalition was just as corrupt as any other massive spacefaring organization. They just hid it better behind messages of peace and goodwill. It was the whole reason he'd fled to the Sargan Commonwealth as soon as he'd been released on parole. At least the Sargans didn't pretend they were something they weren't. The Commonwealth was a massive crime syndicate, and everyone knew it. You expected them to try and kill you. Up until his parole, Cass never would have thought the Coalition capable of such a thing. But was working to make a corrupt organization better, better than leaving it in the hands of those who would only make it worse? After all, not all the trillions of citizens of the Coalition were bad people. Most didn't even know what was happening within the inner politics of the system. Cass had been a lieutenant commander on a starship, and even he hadn't known. But instead of staying to help combat the corruption, he'd fled. And all the innocent souls who were part of the Coalition didn't deserve that. They deserved to have someone fight for them, to stay inside the system and work from within to make it better. Wasn't that what he'd tried to do from the beginning? Not so sure of yourself anymore, huh? Page smirked. Like I said, let's just see what happens when the review board hears my side of it. Cass knew it wouldn't matter. Evie would back him up, and all the evidence pointed to Page disobeying orders. The Coalition couldn't sweep that under the rug. The Tempest had become too important in regards to the encroaching threat. Even now, they were due for a stop-off on 8 before moving on to the next leg of their assignment. I hope it was worth it, Page called as Cass moved to leave, pressing his finger against the pad beside the door. I hope setting the program back a couple years and getting all those people killed was worth an eased conscience. Cass ignored him, allowed the door behind him to slide shut, cutting the man off. Once in the corridor, Cass closed his eyes and took a deep breath. Well? The voice made Cass jump as his eyes shot open to see the robotic body of Box standing beside him. He could be scary quiet when he wanted to be. Well, what? Cass asked, trying to keep his heart from thrumming out of his chest. What did he say? Box asked, his yellow eyes blinking in anticipation. Cass narrowed his eyes. Aren't you supposed to be on duty? Over the past few weeks, Box had ingratiated himself to the ship's doctor and had provisionally become part of the medical crew, just until they left again. Though he seemed to enjoy the work more than anything else Cass had seen him do. I took a lunch break. You don't eat. Are you saying I shouldn't get a break? Cass couldn't help but smirk. He's as dickish as ever. He agrees with Rutledge. Can you believe that? Box turned toward the door, though he didn't go through. Considering he tried to have me disassembled, yeah, I can. Even though I'm practically a doctor now, I have a strong urge to reach through that force barrier and choke the life out of him. Don't let Zax hear you talk that way. She'll take you off duty for sure. Cass moved away from the door and down the hallway. Paige's words rang through his head. What if he hadn't disobeyed orders? How might things be different? How long until we reach eight? Two hours, fifteen minutes. Box fell into step beside Cass. Sounds like the perfect amount of time to visit the bar. Two. As Cass made his way down the corridor, all he could think about was how he shouldn't have had three firebrands in a row, but he needed something to help take the edge off. Page had wormed his way under his skin, and he didn't need to facilitate the first meeting between the Sill and Coalition Central with his head full of antipathy. Of course, being drunk wasn't much better, and he still couldn't get Page out of his head. He paused leaned up against the wall, and pressed his forehead to the cool metal. 
He closed his eyes and took a few breaths. How had he allowed things to go this far? How had he let the Coalition trick him back into working for them? After everything they'd done, after Rutledge and then Cathora. If he'd been smart, he would have stayed in Sargan territory, leaving Evie to fend for herself. But he hadn't. And now he was an integral part of protecting trillions of lives. Captain? Cass snapped his eyes open and pulled away from the wall to find Zenfor standing before him. Even though he'd seen her almost every day since she'd agreed to come over to Tempest from her ship, she was still intimidating. She stood two and a half meters tall, and her skin had a purplish-blue hue. Her short, dark hair fell to the sides, and her penetrating gray eyes, with specks of light seeming to dance inside, surveyed him. What was strange was, if you squinted, she could almost look human. Out of all the species Cass had ever met, the Sil were closer in appearance to humans than most others, which was something of a miracle since they were isolationists in a deep part of space nowhere close to any human settlement. Even Zenfor herself told him they occupied more than one dimension at a time, a trait no other species possessed. No one has called me that in a while, Cass replied, blinking too much, but trying to clear his vision. I heard Commander Diazol say it the other day. Are you not a captain? I was, he replied, but my ship was destroyed trying to retrieve the Atlas, the ship that had stolen your technology. You can just call me Caspian. I am sorry for the loss of your ship, but not for the destruction of that abomination. Are you ready? He nodded. He'd meant to meet her at the door to her quarters, but he'd been late and she'd come looking for him. So much for a great impression. Cass led her down the corridor to the nearest hypervator, where they got inside, her height even more apparent in the small space. Is your companion accompanying us? he asked. She is not. She's staying in our quarters, studying your technology. We've already decided she will stay on the starbase while I accompany you on Tempest to observe this threat firsthand. Why don't you both come? Cass asked, trying to keep the headache threatening to erupt in his head at bay. She can be more effective on the station. It will have greater resources, and we will make more progress apart. Any advancements she develops, she'll transfer directly to me, and we will implement them on Tempest as we travel. Will she work with others? Cass tried to ask delicately. But honestly, he was doing good not to topple over at the moment, much less ask questions in a diplomatic fashion. Zenfor had indicated to him she wanted a consistent liaison, not to be handed around like a piece of yarn. She'll be fine. Zenfor turned to him. What's wrong with you? Nothing. Cass held himself up against the side of the hypervator. Even though they traveled as smooth as anything, he could still feel the vibrations as the carriage moved forward and back, up and down. If he didn't do something, he was going to be tasting those firebrands all over again. You're lying. She bent over to stare him in the eye. Your pupils are dilated, and your skin is clammy. What have you been doing? Trying to get rid of bad memories, he admitted. Zenfor placed her hand on the side of Cass's neck. It felt shockingly cold to the touch, like dry ice. So cold, in fact, he thought it was burning him at first. What? Ow! What are you doing? Hold still, she replied, her gray eyes focused on his. A moment later, the sick feeling dissipated. It was gradual, but as Zenfor removed her hand, the feeling passed. He still wasn't sober, but at least he wasn't in danger of puking all over the hypervator floor. What did you do? Cass put his own hand against his neck where she'd held it. When we're on our ships, they regulate all our biological functions. Our bodies are designed to expel toxins through our pores, but we can also absorb them. All I did was remove some of the foreign material from your blood. Does that mean it's in you now? He asked, still rubbing his neck. It isn't enough to cause me harm and will dissipate within a few minutes. He pulled his eyebrows together. Is that something your people evolved? No, it is something we engineered. The hypervator doors opened on the concourse level and they both walked out. Traversing the short distance to the main airlock, where the door was already open and connected to the long gantry bridge from the station. 
Tempest had pulled into wait only a few minutes before Cass had set off to collect Zen for. At the airlock opening stood seven security personnel. Negotiator Laska, Captain Green, Evie, and four coalition admirals, only one of which Cass knew. All of them smiled, as if meeting reclusive and antagonistic species was part of normal operations, though the smile in Evie's face didn't quite match the others. Cass still hadn't figured out what was going on with her, but he couldn't worry about that now. Mr. Rabot. Admiral Sangvi stepped forward, his hand outstretched. Cass took it, wondering if this man was just as guilty as Admiral Rutledge had been in the operation that captured the Sill ship seven years ago. Because now he was about to meet a Sill in person, and if Zenfor discovered Sangvi had anything to do with the capture of that ship, it could lead to a war instead of peace. Admiral? May I present Consul Zenfor of the Sill Alliance? He stood to the side with Evie as Sangvi, not a small man himself, stared up at Zenfor. A pleasure to meet you in person, Consul. Welcome to the Sovereign Coalition of Aligned Systems, and thank you for your willingness to assist us. He extended his hand for her as well, though she only stared at it, then scanned the other faces she didn't know. Sangvi dropped his hand, turned to the others. May I introduce Fleet Admiral Dix, Vice Admiral Shell, and Chief of Operations Blanton? Cass stood in awe. They were the three top-ranking members of the Coalition Navy and the most powerful officers in the Coalition. They were the ones who made policy, who decided if the Coalition would help a Navy planet or go to war. And Cass couldn't help but wonder if any of them knew about Rutledge's plans. Had any of them sanctioned it? Laska sidled up beside Cass, leaning in. He had to hunch down so she wouldn't have to speak loudly. Not bad for an amateur. I never thought we'd get this far, he replied, but I couldn't have done it without you. Her face didn't betray any emotion. Your flattery is transparent. You need to practice more. He chuckled. I'll keep that in mind. Good luck with the rest of your assignment. I fear the real challenge is yet to come. Wait, Cass screwed up his face. What do you know? No more than you. But making contact is one thing. Maintaining it is another. She stuck out her hand. He gave it a shake. She had a surprisingly strong grip. Stay honest and you'll do fine. Thanks, he said. She strode off past the admirals and Zenfor who were engaged in conversation. He was surprised she wouldn't be coming with them on the rest of the journey. But he assumed her role on the ship had been completed. She'd done her job. There were plenty of other disputes in the Coalition for her to negotiate. I want to see the man who decided still life wasn't worth the price of a weapon. Sinfor interrupted the admirals as they extolled her. Cass couldn't help but feel a surge of pride at her dismissal of them. Anyone else would have been in awe. Yet the Council couldn't care less. Cass snuck a glance at Evie, who didn't seem to be paying attention to the exchange. We will escort you there immediately, Admiral Sankfi said. He turned to Captain Green. How long will the Tempest need before you can depart again? A few days. We experienced some extreme gravitational effects out there. Our chief engineer wants to double-check everything, especially if we're going to be out for an extended period of time. Sangvi gave the captain a stern glare. Don't wait too long. It may seem like we have a lot of time, but these bastards will be here before we know it. We need to know as much about them as possible before they arrive. Why the sudden urgency? Green asked. As best Cass could tell, he wasn't about to be bullied by the Admiral. Let's discuss it later, Sangvi replied, turning back to Zenfor. If you'll allow me, I'll be happy to take you to our brig. Zenfor remained still. I thought I made it very clear I was not to be passed off like a common piece of rock. Sangvi stopped dead in his tracks. His face turned red. Please accept my apologies, Consul. Mr. Rabot will escort you at your convenience. Will you allow us a moment? Zenfor nodded, then walked over to the windows, gazing out of the ships under construction inside the starbase. The Admiral said something to the other ranking officers, who stood off to the side with their security teams, then made his way over to Cass, who did his best to hold his breath. If the Admiral smelled the alcohol on him, 
there was no way it would be good. I understand the trip back was uneventful, Sangby said. No problems. Eve, uh, Commander Diazal and I gave her all the non-classified information of the Coalition, which she's been studying. We figured when she returns to her people, it might help, but we weren't sure how much to share with her. Everything, Sangby whispered. This is a top priority, and we can't afford to be paranoid. If they're going to help us, then she needs to have as much access as anyone else on the ship. I don't care what it takes. He glanced back at the sill, who hadn't moved from her spot. The only thing animated about her was her eyes, flicking back and forth. She's remarkably human-esque. I noticed, Cass said. Have you given any more thought to my offer? You've really outdone yourself on this mission. I've spoken to the other admirals. There was no resistance to giving you back your full commission. In fact, most of us agree it would be preferable. You know certain details you haven't divulged. We appreciate that, and we want to show our appreciation. Cass gritted his teeth. This was the reason he'd left in the first place. The duplicity, the lies. But Paige's words came back to him. How could he affect any change if he wasn't inside the system, working to make it better? Sankey placed his hand on Cass's shoulder. Think about it. Standing offer. He rejoined the other admirals, all of whom were sneaking looks at Zen for. She didn't seem bothered. Evie sidled up beside him. Are you okay? You look pale. The admiral is still offering to give me my commission back, he replied. The man is persistent. I'll give him that. She crossed her arms and joined him in watching the admirals converse with Captain Green in Alaska. I'm considering it. He wasn't looking at her face, but could feel her eyes on him. What changed? I don't know. Maybe I'm tired of being on the outside. Maybe I can do more when I'm back in. Though he alluded to it being contingent on my continued silence on certain matters. Rutledge? Among other things. She made a long exhale. It's your decision. Just don't make it for the wrong reason. He turned to her. I thought you'd be elated. I am, she said too quickly. There's... it's just a lot going on. He narrowed his eyes. Even through the fog of inebriation, he could tell something was off about her. Are you okay? Fine. Bit of free advice, though. Next time you're coming to meet the heads of the Coalition Navy, I suggest you do it sober. He winced, unable to look her in the eye. Instead, he turned away, staring at a stray spot on the carpeted floor. I'll see you later. Have fun down to the brig. She disappeared in the corridors of the ship. Cass took a deep breath, attempting to will the intoxication away. Of course it never worked, but what was the harm in trying? He made his way over to Zenfor, who still hadn't moved from her spot. Ready? I've been ready. Unsure what to say, Cass made his way across the bridge, with her beside him, stealing himself for the inevitable confrontation. Three. Evie slipped through the doors to her quarters, fell against the wall, and slid down, exhausted. This whole endeavor had already been taxing. Ever since she'd seen the orders sending them out to Omicron Terminus, she'd had a dead weight take up permanent residence in her stomach. Not because they had to face this oncoming threat. She could handle that, no problem. No. It was because their route would take them past Cypaxia, and in turn, her father. She pushed herself up and pulled her brown ponytail back over her shoulder, removing the clips that kept it in place. She needed a shower, but first she needed to make a call, a call she'd been putting off for three weeks. As she sat down at her work desk, her eyes found her family's sword hanging on the far wall in her quarters. For the longest time, it had been nothing but a decorative item. That was, until she'd taken it on infiltration missions as an intimidation tactic. And it had worked great. Right up until she'd had to kill with it. She jerked her attention away, activating her personal communication device. Her heart hammered in her chest, and she didn't even want to guess what her blood pressure was at the moment. 
Maybe she should take a page out of Cass's playbook and take a few drinks before making this call. Though it would probably only increase her anxiety and her paranoia. For some reason, alcohol did that to her. She just needed to calm down and focus and try not to lose it. Evie tapped the comm coordinates in and waited for the call to connect. Hello? The screen showed nothing other than an empty room, sparse and composed mostly of beige colors. A couch with upturned pillows sat in the background, beyond which was a window with the shades drawn. Canvases of art leaned against every surface. Her heart panged hearing the voice of her father on the other end. How long had it been since she'd last spoken to him? A year? Right after she'd been transferred to the Tempest. Dad, it's me. Amanda? No, Dad, it's Evelyn. Your daughter. I know my own daughter's name, the man shouted. Evelyn, is that you? Hi, Dad. His face moved into view, and she had to brace herself against the table. He'd deteriorated more than she would have thought possible in a year. What remained of his hair had gone a shock white, and his pupils were milky, despite the fact that doctor reports hadn't indicated any vision problems. But worst of all was his paper-thin skin, like that of a mummy. Guilt pulled at her heart. She should have been making these calls more often. She should have taken some time off to visit. But she'd put it off, focused on work, Anything so she wouldn't have to think about him. How's your work on the, uh, the, uh, Saragossa? His eyes tried to meet her, but faltered, finding some unknown point off screen. I left that post over a year ago. I'm on the Tempest now, remember? Of course, he said, his voice stronger and more serious, more like the father she remembered. How is your work on the Tempest? Good. We've been given a very important mission, which is part of the reason why I'm calling. Oh? He'd stilled, his gaze finally finding her. Evie tried not to let her face betray her emotions. Even if he wasn't all there, he might see something that could set him off. Last time it had been nothing but a simple blink of her eyes. He'd sworn up and down she had winked at him, like she was giving him a secret code. They'd had to call in the emergency doctors, I'm passing Cypaxia in a little over a season. I thought I would come see you, say hi. She'd worked it out. Cypaxia was on a tangential path from their primary course. She could take a shuttle, stay a day, then rendezvous with Tempest on the other side of the system. She'd have to get clearance from Green, but she doubted he would mind slowing the ship to normal speed for just a day. It wouldn't take that much time off their journey, and it was likely the last time she'd ever see the once-great Osborne Diazol alive again. Come to say hi. He scratched his chin, his gaze drifting off to the side of the room again. After all this time, now you decide to visit? Damn. He was more lucid than normal. She should have known better than to expect he wouldn't notice. Dad, I'm sorry. I've been busy. But I'm coming now. Don't bother. I don't want you here. I don't want anyone here. He shoved what few items were on his desk off to the floor, where they shattered. You didn't care enough to stay. You left me. They all leave me in the end. Tears prickled Evie's eyes, but she bore down. This was what she deserved, for neglecting him. Somewhere off screen, a door swooshed open. Mr. Diazol, what are you doing? It was Macha, one of his caretakers, she moved into the screen and pulled him back, restraining him. I have a code nine. Repeat, code nine, she said. It took her a moment to realize the comm link was still open. She glanced at the screen, and her eyes met Evie's. Oh, heavens, Commander, I'm so sorry. He's just having a bad day. Evie's father pulled and strained at her, trying to scratch her with his nails. She deftly avoided his blows. It's okay, Evie said, her voice cracking. I called to tell him I'm coming to visit. I should have warned you what would upset him. My ship will be passing close by in a season. Two more caretakers rushed into view of the screen and helped restrain Osborne, who screamed at all of them. One placed a small device to his neck, and he stopped flailing, his body going slack. 
Macha released him and moved to fill up most of the screen so Evie wouldn't have to watch. I'm sorry you had to see that, Commander. He's been getting worse. I assume you've been reading the reports? Evie nodded. By law, she was required to receive and sign off on them since her father was no longer in full control of his facilities. There weren't many cases like his. Most people could be treated or even cured of mental disease. But there was something strange about what afflicted him, and none of the Coalition scientists could figure it out. Back when he'd been first diagnosed, he'd even tried his hand at discovering what it was, with no success. It's good you're coming. We'll do our best to have him ready for you, but I wouldn't expect much. Macha leaned closer to the screen so her face filled up most of it. He's been getting worse by the day. Do you know an Amanda? He keeps talking about her. No one that he would know, unless it's someone he met after I left, she replied. He's never mentioned her as long as I've been here, but lately it's been like he can't talk about anything else. When did it start? Evie asked. Macha bunched up her face. A few weeks ago? I added it into the reports. Evie sighed. Right, of course. Sorry, things have been hectic here lately. Macha gave her a sympathetic smile. You may want to get here faster if you can. At this rate... I'll look into it. Thanks, Macha. Evie turned off the comm, throwing her head back and covering her face with her hands. How was she supposed to face him in that condition? Even when he'd been lucid, her father had always been a handful to deal with. The word eccentric couldn't begin to contain Osborne Diazol. After she'd grown up and fled that house into the academy, she learned he hadn't always been so off-kilter. Old friends or colleagues who had drifted away from him found her to ask how he was doing, and in the process she learned he had once been much different. But apparently, drifting in space with a baby for a year had changed him fundamentally. For Evie, his behavior had been normal, because it had been what she'd grown up with. Only after getting out of the house did she realize not everyone's parents were subject to hysterical fits of anger or sadness with little or no provocation, and some parents even told their kids they loved them every now and again. Evie grumbled and wiped her eyes, mad that she was letting him get to her again. This is exactly why she didn't call. But with no other living relatives, Dad didn't have anyone else. It was either her or no one, and no matter how good Macha and the others were, they weren't family. She'd talk to Green tomorrow about her request. He deserved at least one last visit. Standing, she avoided glancing at the sword as she made her way to the shower. Four. You might find this strange. Cass walked beside Zenfor as they made their way to Starbase 8's high-security brig. Behind them, two security officers from the station kept their distance, but stayed close enough that Cass couldn't help but notice them. Why is that? Zenfor asked. Because I've seen your way of restraining people and judging them. We do things differently. How so? We don't immobilize our prisoners. Cass tried not to think back to how he'd been held, completely unable to move, against that wall for longer than he could keep track of. It had been nothing short of a test of pure endurance and will not to lose his mind. Immobilization is the most efficient way to ensure the prisoner will not escape, she replied. It's also inhumane. Interesting choice of words, she glanced down at him. In your language, it means cruel but it also could translate to mean non-human, which is a very fitting description. Semantics aside, keeping prisoners long-term completely immobile is impractical. Her voice hardened. Which is why we do not keep prisoners. They are captured, evaluated, judged, and disposed of. And what about the innocent? She narrowed her eyes. Those occasions are rare. Like me. You are not innocent, but you have also proven yourself helpful and trustworthy. Your case is unique. These people weren't much for nuance. Things were very binary for them. You'd have to keep that in mind. Here, he said as they approached the main doors to the brig. A security officer stood to the side, stationed by a small desk. She glanced up when they approached. 
her eyes going wide upon seeing Zenfor. Rabot and guest to see him. We have clearance. Cass held out his hand for her to scan. The security officer tore her gaze from Zenfor and scanned him, not even giving him a second glance. Approved. Cass turned to the security officers following them. Would you mind waiting out here? Sir, we've been ordered. This involves classified coalition information, Cass replied. And unless you have clearance, you don't need to be in there. They exchanged glances before the lead officer nodded. You don't mind if I call in to check. It wasn't a question, and the man's tone made it clear he didn't believe one word coming out of Cass's mouth. He tapped his internal comm and spoke into his hand in a hushed voice. After a moment, his eyes met Cass's as he muttered, A uh, yes, sir. He turned back to Cass and Zenfor. We'll be right outside the door. The doors to the brig opened, revealing a wide space with six different walls. Each wall was taken up by a force barrier, and while the other five were empty, the one closest to the door, and also the largest, had a single occupant, the former Admiral Daniel Rutledge. What is this? Zenfor growled and stomped into the room. Rutledge was seated in a large chair, reading a book. Cass held up his hands as the security officers made a move to follow them in. She'll be fine. There's nothing she can do in here. They stepped back, and the doors of the brig closed, leaving Cass and Zenfor alone with Rutledge, who had glanced up with curiosity. Zenfor stood centimeters from the force barrier itself, staring at the man. Such lavish accommodations. Is he a prisoner or a diplomatic envoy? He's in there for the rest of his life, Cass said. He has a right to have space to live. The brig unit itself was quite large, composed of many rooms, all of them sharing a common wall with the force barrier. When you said serving life in prison was worse than death, I assumed you meant you kept him under constant torture. However, it seems as if he's made comfortable, Zenfor said. That's not how the Coalition does things. No, he's not under constant pain, but he can never leave. That knowledge in itself is debilitating for many of our species. Your people are willing to waste resources in order to maintain a grudge? He shrugged. That's one way of putting it. Caspian, Rutledge said, laying his book on the table beside the plush chair. Welcome back. And you've brought a friend. Consul, this is Admiral Rutledge. Zenfor sneered. This pitiful specimen is the mastermind behind the capture of one of our vessels? I don't believe it. He's so small and weak. When you first told me of him, I assumed he could be nothing other than a god among your people. But this is just disappointing. Cass had a struggle to hide his shock and amusement. He'd never heard anyone refer to Rutledge that way, and he could already see it had angered him. He'd stood from his chair, pulling himself up to his full height, which was still nowhere close to Zenfor's two and a half meters. But soon his anger was replaced with curiosity as his facial features softened. Cass noted he decided to keep his full beard and mustache, even while incarcerated. I don't recognize your species, he said, approaching them. You have me at a disadvantage. That would be the outcome no matter the situation, Zenfor said, staring down at him. This is Consul Zenfor of the Sill Alliance, Cass said, keeping his eyes trained on Rutledge. His old commanding officer gave a slow, disbelieving shake of his head before his shield went back up and his face fell into a neutral gaze. After all his machinations and subterfuge, Cass had managed to beat the man at his own game. And that in itself felt more satisfying than just about anything else he could imagine. I'm humbled. He stopped short of his side of the barrier. You should be. The only way you could have captured one of our ships was by pure luck. You don't have superior skill or intelligence. Rutledge worked his jaw, trying not to get upset. It was something Cass knew about the man after years of serving under him. He had a temper, and for the most part could keep it under control, except when someone insulted him personally. Rutledge never did have an ego that could handle criticism. It wasn't me who performed the job. It was Captain Soon of the USCS Atlas. Yes, I know. Caspian has told me all the details, Zenfor replied. Loss of all hands on board. 
That must have been quite the blow to your program. Nothing we couldn't recover from, Rutledge glared up at her. Yet you had to send the one operative you tried to kill to find out what happened. Because your people obviously didn't understand the concept of multidimensional armaments. They tested the weapon under your orders, correct? That's the reason you're in here. Rutledge didn't respond, only flicked his gaze to Cass, hatred burning in his eyes. Cass had given Zenfor as much information as he could about what had happened to her ship and the one that had captured it, including the building and testing of the weapon itself and how, upon using it, it had killed the entire crew in an instant. I must have done something right, he said, because you're here, and I'm assuming it is to help us. I'm here because we face a mutual threat. We have no interest in the Coalition. We are only using you to gather information and to test defenses. You are our guinea pig, as you put it. Even through the beard, Cass could see the reddening of Rutledge's cheeks. He wasn't used to being put in his place. When Cass had known the Admiral, he'd always had the upper hand. Even behind this field, he seemed to exert a certain authority or control. But all of that had fallen apart the moment Zenfor had entered the room. She turned to Cass. I'm ready to depart. He's not worth killing. Cass did a double take. You were going to kill him? As a trophy for my people. But seeing him now, he wouldn't be worth the slaughter. Plus, I like your idea of having him suffer, if that's what you call this. Not only for the lives of the people he killed in your coalition, but for all the Sill who died in that ship as a result of it being pulled from multidimensional space. Rabo, What is she talking about? Multidimensional space? She had his interest now, and Rutledge leaned even closer to the barrier. It isn't your concern, prisoner, Zenfor held her hand up. Zenfor couldn't have insulted the former admiral any worse if she tried. Cass hid his smile. His face had visibly reddened even more. My actions were for the good of the Coalition. Maybe you don't think we're worth saving, but I do. Everything I did was for the survival of my people, and I would do it all over again. Too bad you weren't more effective at your job, Zenfor replied, turning toward the door. Rabo, Rutledge snapped before he could follow her. I don't know how you did it, but good job. We've never been able to get the sill to play ball, but it looks like you found a way. Cass narrowed his eyes. Because I warned them about you, Cass replied. After disobeying Rutledge's order to fire on the civilian ship, Cass had sent a coded message to the sill, letting them know what was happening. It had been the only thing he could think of to get Rutledge to back off. But even that hadn't been enough. Then you may have just redeemed yourself, son. Those twenty-four souls on the Atlas didn't die in vain after all. They only died because you were too stubborn to leave. Their deaths aren't on my conscience, Rutledge smirked. Don't kid yourself. We're all at fault, every last one of us. But I'm glad it was you who made the connection. It might just end up saving us in the end. I guess sending me to Cathora wasn't such a good idea after all, Cass dropped his voice. That was a... Uh, complex situation. The only reason we didn't pursue you after you escaped was because I decided anyone who had enough balls to claw their way off that hellhole deserved whatever they wanted. Cass stepped back, unsure if he was lying or telling the truth. He'd never openly admitted to being the one who gave Cass his parole, which was how he ended up mining Cyclax ore on Cathora in the first place. But to find out it had been Rutledge who'd stopped any further pursuit after his escape? He wasn't sure how to reconcile that. Regardless, it didn't matter. He followed Zenfor to the exit, where the doors opened, allowing them to leave. A security team escorted Lieutenant Page past as they made their exit. He didn't look at either of them, but kept his head high as the team guided him to the cell opposite Rutledge's. Admiral Sangvi stood at the entrance of the brig his hands clasped behind his back, watching the team move him in. "'I expect you got what you needed?' he asked. "'I was disappointed,' Zenfor replied, not breaking her stride. Sangvi caught Cass by the arm and leaned in. "'You're building up quite the collection, Mr. Rabot. 
Cass surveyed the brig. Tangible proof his presence made a difference. Had someone told him a season ago this would have been the result of him returning to the Coalition, he never would have believed them. Guess it's a good thing I came back. Sangvi nodded. I need to inform you. I don't know if we will continue to hold Lieutenant Page. The Council is deliberating on the right status of your robot. If they don't hold, we'll be releasing Page. Sir, his prejudice didn't just extend to the robot, but to me as well. What about disobeying orders? He leaned in closer, driving his voice. This isn't about prejudice, and it isn't about who disobeyed who. This is about some powerful people in the Coalition keeping a close eye on your actions. Take my advice. Accept your commission. You'll have more leverage for the future. The Admiral gave him a knowing look, then proceeded to follow the security team into the brig, leaving Cass to ponder his fate. More leverage for what? 5. After the spectacle of the brig, Cass escorted Zenfor back to her quarters in Tempest, longing for nothing more than a shower himself. Most people were either on leave or working overtime to make sure the ship was ready for its journey. Not that they wouldn't have opportunities to stop and get help if necessary. They had 80 or 90 days of travel before they even left Coalition space. Still, it would be a long trip, and Cass had never been to that border of Coalition space before, having spent most of his time on the Sargan side. But he did know someone who was familiar with that side of space, not to mention he felt as if he needed to apologize for his earlier behavior. He returned to his own quarters and showered, throwing on a fresh set of clothes, then took the hypervator up to the officer's level. Cass? The door swished open to reveal Evie in her civilian clothes. Oh, I thought you were still on duty. I can come back, he said, glancing down the hall. No, I'm pulling a double duty today because of the accelerated schedule. I just wanted a few minutes out of uniform. Do you... Uh, come in? He wrinkled his brow. Are you sure? You don't look... Have you been getting enough sleep? She made a noise and turned away from the door, retreating into her room. He stepped inside and let the doors close behind him. Was there something you needed? She asked. His plant apology no longer seemed appropriate. Maybe it just wasn't the right time. She was obviously upset about something, and he had to admit he felt somewhat hurt she wasn't willing to share it. Not as if they'd become close, but they had been through a lot together in the past season. She'd literally saved his life from the Sargans and stopped Paige from disassembling Box. So why was she being so standoffish? You should have been down there when Zenfor got a look at Rutledge, he said, a smile creeping across his face. Evie stood by her small sink and poured herself a glass of water, drinking only a small sip. Yeah? Called him pitiful. His face, it was priceless. Sorry I missed it. Her expression remained impassive, and she only continued to stare at some random spot on the wall. This wasn't making things any easier. He might as well take the plunge. Hey, I'm uh, sorry about earlier. I've been down to visit Paige, and I was all worked up. So, Box and I... Went to the bar, I know. She took another sip of the water. It's what you do when things get tough. That stung. Cass tried to keep us cool, but she was being so damn cagey, it was like she was itching to start a fight. At least I don't withdraw from everyone around me. Her eyes snapped to him. Right. Because getting intoxicated is much healthier. She clamped her mouth shut and looked away, setting the glass down. Sorry. This is just... It's a trying time. Maybe he needed to cut her a break. If she would just tell him what was going on, it would all make sense. What if she didn't think she could trust him? He'd managed to hold on to more Coalition secrets than he'd been comfortable with for years. If that didn't make him the prime candidate to vent to, he didn't know what did. I've been told I'm a good listener. I have to be, after living with Box for five years. That brought a small smile to her lips. Thank you, but not right now. Look, I'm getting ready to change. I need to go back on duty, clear my head. Yeah, I need to get back too. 
Zenfor has this ceremony thing she needs to do in a couple of hours before we depart. Are you going? Maybe. Why did this feel like a breakup? He hadn't had many lasting relationships in his 34 years. But the ones that had been the most meaningful often included something like this. The other person pulling away for a reason he couldn't understand. He thought about confronting her with it, then decided it was better off left alone. After all, what were they to each other, really? Colleagues? Acquaintances? She didn't owe him anything, and vice versa. Cass turned and exited back through her doors. Once out in the hall, he recalled he'd meant to mention the commission thing again. After what Sangvi told him about other people watching him, he'd been reevaluating everything. He'd already been somewhat on the fence, but the pressure was growing. Could all of this be nothing more than an attempt by the higher-ups at the Coalition to keep better tabs on him? With his rank reinstated, he'd be accountable. But he'd also have more authority. Could he really put everything they tried to do to him in the past? After all, wasn't the person primarily responsible for his misery behind a force shield at this very moment? Still no better off, Cass headed down the corridor toward the mess hall. Evie let out a long breath. The last thing she needed was Cass butting in right where he wasn't needed. It was nice of him to want to help, but no one could help her with this. Her family's problems were her own, and the less everyone else knew, the better. In a way, it was fortunate not many people had heard of her or her father by the time she got to the academy. Not like on Sisk, where it seemed everyone and their brother knew her last name. The lack of a mother figure in her life hadn't helped things either. It wouldn't have been so bad if her father had some pictures of her, or at least some memories, but there was nothing. Her father refused to talk about Evie's mother, and wouldn't even confirm she'd been a crew member aboard the Austin. After the ship's accident, he'd been reassigned to Sisk, and that's where Evie had grown up. The unique thing about Sisk was it was one of the only Coalition planets with more than one intelligent dominant species on the planet. In fact, there were twelve, some similar, others completely foreign to each other. But it was like the planet's evolutionary cycle was on overdrive, how all twelve species managed to develop and evolve without murdering the hell out of each other she couldn't figure out. But it had made for an interesting environment growing up. Evie deposited the rest of her water back in the sink and the glass in the matter recycler, making her way over to her closet. She pulled out one of her five identical uniforms and slipped it on, then took the time to gather her hair back into its ponytail, which she braided and tied together so it lay across her left shoulder. She watched the green-tinted eyes staring back at her in the mirror. They seemed a little darker today, less vibrant than usual. She'd assumed her mother's eyes were the same color, since her father's were a deep brown. But of course it was impossible to find out. She had hoped once she'd become an officer, she would have access to more files on the Austin and the accident that claimed all but twelve lives of the crew. Yet there was nothing but the single file with very little information. Evie tore away from the sink, pulling her boots on and making sure she hadn't left anything she might need behind. Walking out of her room with purpose, she tried not to think about the conversation with Dad earlier. But it was all that had filled her mind ever since she'd hit the send button. The last time she'd seen him, he'd taken up painting again as a way to keep his mind fresh. He'd been quite the artist in his youth. And if the video was any evidence, he'd only become more prolific in the past few years. He was a brilliant person, and it had broken her heart to see him degrade so quickly. But that was the nice thing about the Coalition. They had provided all the care he would ever need. How could an organization that was committed to caring for the infirm be all bad, as Cass suggested? He was convinced he was seeing conspiracies everywhere. And while, yes, Rutledge had been doing some very reprehensible things, he was by no means a representative of the entire Coalition. One undesirable element. Except... Except there had been Paige as well. She'd never seen prejudice like that before. It ran deep in his veins. He still didn't think he'd done anything wrong. 
She shook the thoughts from her head as she took the hypervator to the bridge. A few repair crews were checking some of the stations, but it was nothing like the repairs required after the battle with the Sargans. At least the Sill had left most of their ship intact. Lieutenant Uma, Paige's replacement, stood at the tactical station, running what looked like battle simulations. Brushing up? Evie asked. The lieutenant grinned, her sharp features in contrast to her amicable demeanor. Just familiarizing myself with the controls. I don't want to be caught unaware out there. You did well against the Sill. Thanks, but it's better if I have all these controls down solid. My reaction time needs to be less than a second when you or the captain give an order. I don't need to be over here hunting for a button. Evie placed her hand on the young woman's slender shoulder. I'm sure you'll be fine. Is the captain in? Uma glanced at the command room. In there. He came back about an hour ago and hasn't left. Thanks, Evie replied, making her way over to the command room. Come in, Green said through the doors as Evie stopped in front of them. They opened to reveal Green at his desk, reading a report on a data pad. Commander? Sir, I need a minute of your time. He leaned back in his chair and set the pad down, indicating she should sit. She took the nearest seat. I have a request. Name it. I need to take a day off Tempest. When we reach Hypaxia, my father's there, and he's not well. I could take a shuttle, then rendezvous with Tempest on the other side of the system the following day. I see, Green replied. You know the shuttles can't match Tempest's speed. We'd have to drop to a normal undercurrent velocity. Yes, sir. I realize it's an inconvenience, but I may not get another chance to see him. His condition is deteriorating. Green stared at her a moment, his dark eyes watching hers. I think we can spare a day, don't you, Commander? She broke into a smile. Thank you, sir. I'd say you've earned it. One day won't make a difference as far as Andromeda is concerned. Andromeda. She'd only heard the alien threat referred to in such a manner one other time, when they were all in Admiral Sangvi's office. It sounded ominous. She turned to leave. Commander? Green called. Sir? Will you be attending the ceremony? She arched an eyebrow. Ceremony? For the sill. Rabot says they have an elaborate departure scheduled, since the Consul's companion will be staying on aid. I'll try to make it. She really didn't feel like watching a goodbye ceremony at the moment. Maybe they would need to run the bridge while it was happening. See that you do. Six. For the duration of our time apart, and for the rest of my life, I will always carry a piece of you with me. And me with you. Cass watched from the sidelines of the docking bay where Zenfor stood facing the other sill, Moles. They had put their biosuits back on, including the helmets that obscured their faces. It had been the way Cass had first encountered the Sill, and from what he understood, what they considered their natural state. The only difference was the gems that had been suspended within their helmet structures weren't present. They had been the only source of light on a Sill ship, and Cass had to assume they had something to do with being connected to the Sill ship itself, as the Sill considered their ships to be living beings capable of existing in more than one dimension. He'd seen precious little of Moles since she'd arrived with Zenfor, she chose to spend most of her time in their quarters studying. She was shorter than Zenfor, but not by much. Though she wasn't as imposing as the consul, her silence the past few weeks had unnerved Cass whenever he was around them. Where Zenfor offered information freely and without restraint, Moles was often silent to his inquiries, with no explanation given. Hearing her speak at this ceremony was a rarity. Senfor reached up with one of her gloved hands and placed it on Moles's shoulder. The other still did the same, and they bent their heads until their helmets were touching. It seemed like an elaborate ceremony just for saying goodbye. Was this how every still parting was marked? Suddenly Cass felt uncomfortable. 
as if he was watching something far too intimate to be seen by someone else. He wasn't the only one of the docking bay, either. A small crowd had gathered, at Zenfort's insistence, to witness the separation. And he still didn't know why. Wouldn't they want privacy in this moment? Especially if they were more than just colleagues? Cass had never obtained a solid read on the relationship, though now it seemed as if it was much more intimate than he'd realized. He shifted on his feet, crossing his arms as his gaze met with Evie's on the other side of the bay, standing beside Green and a few of the other bridge officers. Admiral Sangvi smiled as he watched the two still hold each other with their heads bowed. Then, as if from nowhere, a melodic sound filled the space. It had started low, then grew until it echoed and reverberated against the walls. It was nothing like Cass had ever heard before. It was enchanting, otherworldly, and captivating in a strange way. It was the type of music that immediately struck him at his core, and he knew in that instant he would never forget it. Something shifted in the air, and he found himself blinking away tears welling up in his eyes. What was wrong with him? He never cried, especially not to music. But there was something about the sounds. There were no words as far as he could tell, just a harmonic melody that reached down to the depth of his soul. Before he could fully comprehend it, the music had stopped, and Zenfor and Meles had released each other. They reached back and unclasped their helmets, pulling them off. The eyes of both still glistened as they turned from each other. Meles approached Admiral Sangvi, saying something to him in a whisper, and he nodded, leading her to the other end of the docking bay and down through the bridge connecting the ship to the station. Zenfor remained where she was, stoic as she faced the far wall. I missed half my break for this, said an ensign, a young man probably no older than twenty-two. He had a mop of messy brown hair, but which matched his amber skin perfectly. He'd probably been one of those kids who thought he could get through life on looks alone. Cass had seen him once before in passing, but had never spoken to him before. Hey, Cass whispered, you witnessed something no other human has ever seen before. Be a little more respectful. The ensign pursed his lips and gave Cass a side eye. Whatever. Big deal. So she sung to her. Zenford turned her gaze to the ensign, and he went rigid. She walked over to him, not even glancing at Cass. You disrespect my culture. N no, I was just... The kid trembled. When a Sill can't appreciate a historical ceremony, such as the parting of friends, he is sent for judgment. Cass's eyes went wide. He'd seen the judgment chamber and had almost become a victim to it. He was also aware that as the captain of her own ship, Zenfor could technically consider herself a judge. If he didn't do something quick, she might end up coating the docking bay with the ensign's blood. Consul? Cass stepped in front of the ensign. Please excuse some of our more inexperienced citizens. In our society, a person does not fully mature until they are twenty-five years old, and thus tend not to appreciate the magnitude of certain aspects of life. We allow them to serve so young, as we want the experience to be formative for them. He glanced back at the ensign. Sweat had formed at his brow, and he was almost cowering behind Cass. I see, Zenfor replied, studying the man behind Cass. I will not have my culture mocked by an inferior species. There must be retribution. Cass flicked his eyes to Evie, who, along with Green, had tensed, but remained where they were, their eyes glued on the confrontation. There will be. He will be reassigned to menial labor for punishment. But he can't learn and grow if he's injured or killed. Killed? Cass heard the kid say. It sounded like it was coming from a child. All the prior bravado had evaporated. Zenfor remained steadfast, a few beats too long for Cass's comfort, before turning and exiting the docking bay. Cass heaved a sigh of relief, spinning on the ensign. He grabbed him by the collar. Are you stupid? Don't you understand how delicate all this is? I, I'm sorry, sir, the ensign said, true fear in his eyes. What's your name? Magnus, sir. 
Jackson Magnus. The words came out in heaves, as if he was going to hyperventilate right there in the docking bay. Magnus? Both Cass and the ensign turned to see Evie striding toward them. Cass let go of his collar. Report to your duty station. He nodded and took off in the other direction, giving Cass one last look as he left. Evie turned to him. He has to pay a punishment. I don't know how bad this is yet, Cass said. You should go after her. Smooth things over, Evie said. I'll take care of Magnus. Cass nodded and jogged to catch up with the sill, who was practically stomping down the hall. Fortunately, no other crew members were in her way. Is this cooperation? Is this respect? she demanded. I'm not going to apologize for him. He made a mistake, and now he's going to pay for it. Not everyone of the Coalition is like that. No, you only go behind each other's backs to enact secret agendas. In my culture, the connection we have with each other is sacred above all else. Our shipmates are our family. No connection is too trivial or inconsequential, and we do not betray each other. If we do, the result is death. Cass shook his head, still working to keep up with her long strides. I wish we were that involved, but we're still learning. Your people might be an example, she spun on him. How can you stand it, being among all these people and yet still being an outcast? I've seen the way many of them look at you. Does it not wear on you every single day, the way they keep you at arm's length? He winced. She wasn't wrong. Being back in the coalition hadn't exactly been easy. But it had been necessary, even if he hadn't wanted to admit it at the time. It's a challenge. Zenford leaned back, regarding him. Such a conundrum. Records exist of my people being like yours once, at each other's throats constantly. But we made it through. You will too, I suppose. Then you'll still help us? Despite what just happened? I gave you my word, and I follow through. If nothing else, your coalition is a reminder of mistakes we made in the past we don't wish to repeat. She turned and resumed her course. Cass watched her go. Even a sill could see how detached he was from everyone else here. Maybe he should take Sangvi's advice. Everything seemed to be pointing him in that direction. What would be the harm? Cass might not have been right for the old coalition. But this new, better coalition, without all the corruption, might just be what he needed. But he needed to talk to one more person before he made a final decision. He headed for sick bay. 7. The doors to sick bay slid open, revealing a pristine medical ward. All of the beds were made, and all of the equipment was in its place. Everything looked brand new, as if the place had just been constructed. Cass glanced over to see Dr. Zax working away in her office. As the only Yaks Inax on board, she'd be hard not to recognize, what with her two sets of parallel arms and six eyes. She had been the one to accept Box as a semi-permanent sickbay assistant, which Cass realized he'd never properly thanked her for, as it had given Box something to do all day, other than sulk and watch net dramas. She glanced up when she saw him enter. Caspian, what can I do for you? Zack stood and maneuvered around her desk, a smile on her thin lips. I came to see Box before we took off. We'll be launching in half an hour or so. He's not here, I'm afraid. Most of the staff is down in Cargo 4, double-checking we have everything we'll need for the journey. Last I was aware, he was down there with them. Cass gave her a curt smile. I'll head down there, then. Everything's still working out? Couldn't be better. She raised two of her arms in a welcoming gesture. Box's bedside manner still needs work, but he's an excellent nurse. His precision is unmatched. What was his original designation? He was originally built as a military robot, but then repurposed into a miner after the military realized they built too many. Him and 4,000 other units. It's a shame, Zax replied. If they're all as precise as he is, they would have made excellent healers. I guess he got lucky. 
I assume you haven't heard anything about the status of his rights? Cash shook his head. The Admiral promised to tell me as soon as he found out. I'll let you know as soon as I do. I doubt it will make a difference here. Zax waved one of her lower hands in dismissal. I'd just like to see them try to come in here and take him from us. I really hope it doesn't come to that, Cass replied. He hadn't even considered what would happen if Box was deemed not to have any rights. How would the coalition react? Obviously, Page would be released, or at least half his sentence reduced. Would they really try to forcibly remove Box from the ship? Especially in the middle of this crisis? Have a good day, Caspian. You're always welcome here if you need anything, Zax finally said, after the silence between them had become uncomfortable. Thanks, yeah. I appreciate that. The doctor nodded and returned to her office, and Cass made a motion to open the conversation back up to thank her for everything she'd done, but the moment was gone. Instead, he returned to the corridor and made his way to Cargo 4. 197 units of caloricum. Two more than the manifest shows, Bach said, his head in one of the portable containers off to the side of Cargo 4. Cass strolled up behind him as he read off the serial numbers on each of the units for Nurse Menkel, who stood off to the side. Hey, Box. Box raised his head, staring at Cass with his yellow eyes. You aren't medical personnel. No shit. He raised himself to full height. Non-medical personnel will need to be removed via suspension of nutsack. Hey, I was... Wait, what? I have instituted a new rule... Medical personnel are not to be interrupted under penalty of nutsack suspension. It's very easy. I grab your nuts, then haul you out of here by them. Cass took a step back. Box, he warned, do not... Box turned to Nurse Mankel. Did I not institute that policy upon arrival? Sweat had formed on Mankel's brow as he watched the exchange. I, uh... I thought you were joking? Do it! And I'll make sure your consciousness is inside a repair drone by the end of the day, Cass warned. Box's eyes blinked twice, indicating he was considering it. He leaned closer to Cass. It'd be okay. I can reattach it easily. It's a simple surgery. Box. He lifted his index finger out to Cass, wiggling it. Dangle, dangle. Cass smacked his hand away. Can you cut it off for one minute? I need to talk to you. Box made the sound of a sigh deep in his chest and handed his data recorder to Nurse Mankel. If you need me to watch you drink yourself into a stupor again, I'm afraid I'm on duty. I'm thinking about taking my commission back. Cass's eyes caught Mankel's gaze. He leaned around Box. Do you mind? This is a private matter. The nurse turned to one of the other crates, his back to them. Is this because I gave you a hard time about it? Box asked. Don't tell me you thought I was serious. I'm just thinking it might be better for everyone, including you and me. They still haven't decided on your status yet. If it comes back as unfavorable, as an officer of the coalition, I might be able to protect you. Box made a sound that sounded like a chortle, but not quite. Don't pretend you're doing this for me. I'm perfectly fine without your help. You want to do this for you but I can't figure out why. Weren't you the one who said he would never go back to them? That the coalition wasn't worth getting involved with? What about jail? What about Cathora? Cass felt like he was going on the defensive. I think most of that was Rutledge. He even copped to it. He was in charge of all of it? The entire mining operation? All the parolees? The parole board? And the Durander cronies staffing the mine? He did it all alone? Box's glare seemed more penetrating than should be legal for a robot. Okay, maybe not completely alone. But how am I supposed to help change things when I'm outside of the system? Seems like you're doing a pretty good job so far. He couldn't argue with that. I think I can do better. I think I can do more. Maybe even figure out how deep all this goes. I can't do that if I'm not even part of it. Box's eyes flickered in a pattern Cass recognized his confusion. Boss! 
Aren't there more important things you need to focus on? Last time I checked, we've got an unknown alien threat headed here, with no way to defend against them. Don't you see, Cass whispered, this is a chance for me to get what I had back. But this time, I won't have a bunch of people working against me from the inside. What about getting your own ship, going off to explore? Or have you given that up? Box, Cass made sure Mangel was far enough away not to hear. No one is going to be exploring anything for a while. This trip out to Omicron Terminus is going to take at least two seasons. And if we survive, it will be another two back to Coalition space. Exploring really isn't an option anymore. At least not until this is all over. If we even survive. I can't believe my censors, Box said, returning to his crate. After all they've done to you, and after all this time, you're willing to give them a second chance. I don't understand humans sometimes. Something tugged at Cass's mind, but he pushed it away. It didn't matter what Box said. This was the right call, at least for right now. Thanks for your help, he said, turning his back to Box. Any time, Box called after him. Seems like the castration wasn't necessary after all. Cass gritted his teeth, but didn't take the bait. He did have the urge to stop by the bar, but instead made his way back to his quarters. The captain had asked him to be on the bridge when they departed, but he was exhausted, and the day was barely half over. He needed a quick nap before returning back to duty. It wasn't like he had an official title or position, though being the liaison between Zenfor and the rest of the crew was taxing. Maybe Box was right. Maybe he wasn't cut out for this line of work anymore. He'd spent so much time at the Sargan Commonwealth, he'd grown used to doing things a lot differently. But he'd been able to adapt to that lifestyle, so why couldn't he adapt back? Cass reached his quarters and shrugged off his jacket, tossing it on the already messy bed. He passed the mirror and stopped, trying to imagine what he would look like in a Coalition uniform again. He'd filled out some around the middle and stood with a slight hunch. He straightened himself and sucked in his gut, imagining how the gray uniform would fit close and tight. They were always tight. It wouldn't take long to print one, but it would mean he could no longer keep the jacket. Shaking his head, Cass moved down from the mirror and pulled his boots off, falling on his bed. But as soon as he closed his eyes, all thoughts of sleep left his mind. Instead, it was filled with indecision. Not to mention trying to figure out how he was going to integrate Zenfor into this crew if he couldn't even integrate himself. He tossed and turned for at least fifteen minutes before becoming frustrated and giving up. Cass retreated to his washroom and cleaned himself up, putting on a fresh set of clothes. Maybe Zax could give him something for sleep later. Tapping the personal comm they'd issued him, he still didn't have a coalition issue one again, for obvious reasons. He sent a call to Zenfor. Yes, she said, sounding impatient. Cass saw no point in beating around the bush. There was only one way to get the crew used to Zenfor, and that was to make her as visible and accessible as possible. She'd had the entire trip back to study their history and current technology. It was time to put all of that knowledge to work, Tomorrow, I'd like to start in engineering. You can meet those you haven't seen before, and we can... You mean the Claxian? Cass nodded, even though he was alone. Yes, I mean Commander Sester and the others as well. We'll be working closely with them. I'll meet you down there tomorrow at 0500. I'll be anticipating it, she ended the call. That was easier than he thought. He had been afraid she might be resistant after what had happened to the docking bay. But it didn't hurt she had expressed to him on multiple occasions about wanting to meet the commander, the only Claxian on board. For the entire journey back from Sill Space, she and Maless had chosen to stay in their quarters, studying. Their only contact had been Cass checking in with Zenfor daily to ensure everything was still tolerable. Captain Green had thought it would be better for them to keep to themselves until they reached the Starbase, when everything could be formalized. Cass wasn't sure it had gone how the captain had hoped, but everyone was in place now. Time was short, 
and if she was going to help them fight this threat, they needed to start working on their defenses. She couldn't stay holed up in her quarters any longer. Under his feet, Cass felt the plating vibrate, indicating the main engines had ignited. They were underway. 8. The following morning, Cass was up earlier than normal. Sleep had eluded him most of the night. He'd fought a mighty urge to visit the bar again. Evie's words of disapproval echoed through his head, and instead had stayed in his quarters, reading his old maps. After everything he'd been through, it was kind of a miracle he'd kept them this long. It had taken him years to collect them from dozens of different coalition worlds when he was still an officer, often bartering for them, though a few were a gift. Most planets didn't keep paper maps anymore, but the few they did have, he liked to collect. There were even a few from Earth, though many were in terrible condition, barely legible in some places, but he enjoyed them all the same. When he'd been arrested, they, along with all the rest of his personal items from the Atlas, had been stored in a secure facility on 8. After he'd fled the coalition with Box, the robot had volunteered to retrieve them for him. Of course, it had required some modifications to Box's system, resulting in some additional enhancements that Cass hadn't anticipated. But when Box showed up with the tubes of maps in his arms, Cass could have kissed him. In fact, he thought he might have mentioned it to Box at the time, and Box responded with some smart-ass remark. Something about using ancient technology to navigate the stars fascinated Cass. The ancient humans who charted many of the systems didn't have all the same conveniences they did now. But of course, it had been over 2,000 years ago. After wasting enough time reminiscing, Cass had rolled them back up and replaced them in his closet in their protective sleeves, then readied himself for the day. He considered calling Zenfor again to make sure she was already on her way, but thought better of it. She didn't need him micromanaging her schedule. He was a liaison, not an assistant. If she couldn't get to engineering on time, that was on her, not him. As he made his way to engineering, thoughts of how he would introduce Zen for Decester plagued his mind. As far as he knew, neither species had ever encountered each other, despite some similarities they shared. The Claxians were an advanced race, and had helped the humans form the coalition millennia ago, despite all the physical differences. Most Claxians were four to five meters high, with a central shaft for a body, with five long appendages protruding from it. Each appendage could act as a hand, as they ended in five fingers. They didn't have any eyes or optical sensors of any kind, but had the ability to sense and perceive objects beyond the visual spectrum. They also didn't speak. Instead, they communicated through a type of telepathy only certain individuals could receive. Because of this, they tended not to integrate into large social cultures, like that in the starship. But Commander Sester was unique in that regard. It was only his presence on the ship that provided the skill and ability to operate the undercurrent drive, which was twice as fast as any other Coalition ship. He spoke through an avatar when he needed to, which in most cases was Ensign Tyler, one of the junior engineers. Cass found he could also hear the thoughts of the Claxian and transmit thoughts back to him if he concentrated hard enough. While the Sill didn't use telepathy to the best of his knowledge, they did intentionally obscure their vision while on their ships. Cass had since learned their biosuits provided them with everything they needed while aboard, including the need to see, breathe, eat, or eliminate. How that was possible, he wasn't sure. But then again, the Sill had tens of thousands of years of technology beyond that of most coalition worlds. But he found it strange both species didn't need the use of eyes to excel. He'd always considered his sight his most important sense. Maybe this small commonality could be used as a bridge of sorts. Negotiator Laska would be proud. Allow me through, or you'll find yourself cut in half while you still breathe. Zenfor's voice reached Cass halfway down the hallway, and he broke into a sprint the last few meters to the engineering entrance. He found Zenfor there, standing akimbo with her hands curled into claws, while Ensign Tyler and two other engineering crew faced her, a pistol in one of their hands. Whoa, whoa, stand down, Cass yelled. 
though the engineers paid him no attention. He maneuvered himself in between them and Zenfor, using his body to block as much of her as he could. What the hell is going on here? She says she has clearance to enter engineering, Tyler said. He was young, with a crop of red hair combed to the side, and a boyish face he hadn't quite grown into yet. She does, Cass said, keeping his eye on the pistol. Unless you want an interstellar incident, you need to put that away. Now. The engineer glanced at her friend beside her and withdrew the weapon, dropping it to the side. You do understand she's our ally, right? Her job is to help? Maybe you don't understand, since you've been off the job a while, Tyler said. But we have protocols. We can't allow someone into sensitive areas of the ship without an escort. I'm her escort, Cass yelled. You weren't here, Tyler retorted. And she threatened us with bodily harm if we didn't let her through. His eyes cut to the side, and he shook his head. Cass furrowed his brow. Something had distracted Tyler. Is he speaking to you? Right now? I am. Hello, Commander, Cass thought. Hello again. I told Tyler he was being too impulsive, but he's young and doesn't like to listen. Please escort the consul inside. I assume you caught that, Cass asked. A scowl formed over Tyler's face. Come with me, he finally said. Cass glanced behind him to see Zenfor had relaxed her stance, though her hands were still in claws. Your crew was not making a good first impression, she said. I know. We will do better. A lot of people will be nervous around you at first. The only knowledge most people have of the Sylph are of the so-called war a hundred years ago. They're not sure what to expect. She dropped her hands. I should have spent more time away from Aless on the journey from Koval. Maybe. But we can't do anything about that now. The engineers had made their way to the giant door, which sealed off engineering from the rest of the ship. As Tyler approached, the door rolled away as if on a giant track, and the three engineers stepped through. The one with a pistol depositing it in the weapons locker beside the door. Cass led Zenfor inside and kept an eye on her face as she took the place in. While she didn't show outright surprise, he thought there had been something flicker in her eyes when she saw Sester, relaxed in his custom-built cradle at the far end of the large room. Upon their entrance, one of Sester's arms pulled itself away from the cradle and seemed to stare at them before the rest of his body followed, and he began his cartwheels over to Zenfor, covering the distance in only one full revolution of his body. I've been looking forward to this, Zenfor said. Tyler stepped forward. He says... Zenfor raised her hand. Yes, I heard him. Thank you, Commander. I feel the same. She hadn't taken her eyes off Sester. Cass glanced over to Tyler, whose face had gone red as he stepped back. Cass had seen the same look on Tyler's face when he realized Cass could communicate with Sester as well. My people have always been curious about yours, Zenfor said, as Sester bent his lower appendages so his entire body lowered. No, it's interdimensional. Cass stood back. It looked like he wouldn't have to facilitate the meeting after all. They seemed to be getting along fine without him. Though he did wish he could hear what they were saying. It is a private conversation. Cass smirked, unable to hide his amusement at Sester monitoring his thoughts. You'll tell me if she says anything concerning. Of course, Sester replied. That was good enough for him. Sester had covered for him when Cass had gone to find the sill originally, and he hadn't needed to. But he'd seen the need, even if Cass's methods hadn't exactly been up to coalition standards. Cass turned to Tyler. So, where can we set her up? She'll need a large workspace, as she'll be working with physical prototypes. Tyler narrowed his eyes. We don't have a lot of room in here. I can fit her over by Pearson. Cass glanced over to the workstation he was referring to. Zenfor's shoulders were wider than the station itself. It wouldn't be adequate at all, and Tyler knew it. Is there a problem, Mr. Tyler? Nope. No problem, sir. He had a shit-eating grin plastered all over his face. Cass took a deep breath and tried not to let it bother him. The ensign was doing nothing other than pushing his buttons. 
He knew Cass had no real authority over him, not as a criminal and a civilian, regardless if his warrants had been rescinded or not. Everyone still saw him as the same man who'd been dragged in front of a court-martial and sentenced the very same day, seven years ago. And they wouldn't ever see him as anything else. Not unless he made them. He took one last look at Sester and Zenfor, deep in their mental conversation. That was it. He was tired of putting this off. Nine. I've changed my mind. Cass barged into Green's command room. Green barely glanced up, scanning reports in front of him as the stars flew by in a blur behind him. About? Admiral Sangvi's offer. I want my commission back. Green arched an eyebrow. He informed me you might see the light one day. He set down his data pad. Why the sudden change of heart? It will make everything easier. Trying to be a civilian liaison between an alien species and the members of this crew isn't a walk in the park. I need some authority if I'm to get anything done. And if I hope to make some real changes. I see. And how do you see your role changing if the Admiral reinstates your rank? It won't. But I'll have the authority to give Zen for everything she needs without coming to you or Commander Diazol for approval. Mr. Ravo, I know you know how a starship works, Green sighed. There are protocols for every person, and there is a chain of command. I can't just have another lieutenant commander on board and expect to squeeze him in. You'd be the fourth highest ranked person on the ship. I still wouldn't be a full member of the crew. Think of me as nothing more than an envoy, like Negotiator Laska was. My only responsibility is Consul Zenfor, and I'll report to Commander Diazol. There's no need to shift anything around on my account. Green leaned forward, placed his elbows on his desk, and let out a long breath. You're sure about this? With you as a ranking member of the Coalition, I'll expect a certain level of professionalism from you. You remember how it goes, right? I do, sir. He managed to add the sir. He'd need to brush up on coalition procedure in his off time. Then let's get on with it. I'm sure the Council needs your help to get started. He tapped his comm unit connected to his desk. It was silent for a moment before it pinged. Cordell? Sangvi's face appeared on the transparent screen. To Cass it looked backward. He's ready, Green replied, glancing up at Cass. Through the screen, Cass could see a smile spread across Sangvi's face. I knew it was only a matter of time. Green motioned him to come around the desk so they both could see Sangvi. Mr. Rabot, I'm glad you finally decided to rejoin the fold. Thanks. I mean, I'm glad to do it. I think it's better than the alternative. So do I. Sangvi glanced off screen. He touched something Cass couldn't see. This won't take long. Caspian Philip Rabot, do you pledge yourself to the Sovereign Coalition of Planetary Systems? Do you promise to uphold its values, protect its citizens, and give your life, if necessary, to the preservation of its way of life? I promise. Cass remembered a similar pledge in the Academy. Do you, in good faith, accept the responsibilities and privileges associated with being an officer in the Sovereign Coalition, including the responsibility of all those under your command, should you be deemed worthy? I accept, Cass replied, ignoring the pit growing in his stomach. He pushed it back down, focusing instead on saying these words. He leaned into the screen. And finally, will you, to the best of your ability, Always be of upstanding character with a positive moral compass? Will you use this compass to point others to the way, to expand the peaceful and humanitarian nature of the Coalition? And when help is needed, will you always answer the call? You have my word. His heart rate had picked up, despite having been through the ceremony before. The last time had been much less personal. Him and a thousand other cadets on their first and last days of training— the oaths were recited to them on their first day at the academy, but they were told not to respond until they were prepared to graduate. A cadet needed to internalize all the oaths, and only after years of study and discipline and mental preparedness would they be ready to answer. So the questions were posed again at graduation. Everyone said yes to them all. 
Cass had never heard of a no, though he was sure some rebel had tried to make a spectacle of themselves sometime in the past. But even now, as he answered the oaths, he couldn't help but think of Rutledge. Had he upheld the standards? No. And it was up to Cass to clean up his mess. Then it is my pleasure to welcome you back into the Sovereign Coalition Navy. Admiral Sangvi beamed. Your previous rank of lieutenant commander has been formally reinstated as of 1800 hours today. Please report to your commanding officer for your assignment. Captain, get this man his uniform. Yes, sir, Green replied, keeping his eyes on Cass. Commander Rabot, it is a pleasure to have you back among us. I expect great things from you. He turned to look at the captain. Cardell, keep me apprised of your journey. The SIL here on eight has already begun drawing up some plans. That's excellent news. The uh, commander here was just telling me Consul Zenfor is in a similar position. Very good. I expect a report next week. Sangvi out. The screen disappeared. Green returned to his chair as Cass made his way back around the other side of the desk. I suppose congratulations are in order, Green said. Evie strode down the corridor, not bothering to acknowledge any of her fellow crewmates as she passed. She was too inside her own head. The news had come from Green only fifteen minutes ago. She'd considered just letting it go, that it was nothing more than a quirk of Cass's behavior. But he had been so adamant, something about it seemed wrong. So she had to see him for herself, because despite the captain's reputation, it just couldn't be true. Upon reaching his door, she didn't even pause to think. Instead, she hit a small switch beside the door. Command override. Diazol voice print access 029. The door slid open to reveal Cass's quarters, and she stepped inside without another thought. He was in the bedroom section of the space, his bare back to her as he faced his closet. But she could already see from his pants he wore the standard coalition uniform. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it. She shook her head. Whoa! Cass jumped and turned at the same time, his eyes wide. He held the shirt in his hands up to his chest. How did you... How about knocking next time? The back of his left hand was slightly irritated from where Zax had inserted his coalition-issued comm. It was true. Why would you do this? I never thought you were actually serious. Evie said. Cass glanced down to his naked chest and slipped on his undershirt from the uniform that had just been printed for him. It wasn't an easy decision. He fumbled with the outer shirt, complete with his rank. But if I'm ever going to make things any better, I can't do it from the outside looking in. And this will make everything with Zen for a lot easier. Evie sucked her lips in between her teeth. No, there's something else going on here. He didn't meet her gaze. You'd never do this. Not unless something happened. What's going on? Cass seemed to gather his resolve. Nothing. What's with you lately? Why are you so mopey? That's different. It's personal, she retorted. And it doesn't have to do with the daily operation of this ship. Your decision does. Despite the fact I wanted to run you through with my sword when we first met... I feel like we've grown close over the past season. Why can't you tell me? Something darkened his face, but it was gone almost as fast as it had appeared, and that damn smirk appeared again. He put up his hand. I told you, without a rank, it's harder to get anything done on this ship. How was the crew supposed to take orders from a civilian? She shook her head, feeling the sting from his lack of trust. I don't understand you. All that time talking about how the Coalition betrayed you. And then, just like that, there you are wearing the uniform again. After all they've done to you. She turned around, her anger at his nonchalance getting the better of her. Or maybe it was all a lie. Maybe you fabricated all of it. To what? Gained sympathy because you screwed up? Is that it? No, he insisted. It was all true. I just... I'm tired of being an outsider. She shook her head in disbelief again. 
You can't just put on a uniform and pretend it changes who you are. By doing that, you're betraying yourself. And you're mocking me. He furrowed his brow. What? No, I'm not. This has nothing to do with you. How many times did you tell me the coalition was a waste of my time? Evie asked, her anger rising, pointed to the small insignia on the shoulder of his outer shirt. Now, all of a sudden, they're okay? All your reservations about them gone? Like that? She snapped her fingers. That's not... I mean, it's... He struggled to find his words, tripping over himself to follow her. He was obviously lying. But what hurt the most was the fact he thought he couldn't trust her to whatever he was going through. Hadn't they been through enough together that he trusted her yet? It's convenient, I'll give you that much. Very convenient. Before they'd left Sill Space, he'd been insistent he'd never wear the uniform again. So what had changed? Continuing to question him would only piss her off further, and she wasn't getting anywhere. He decided she wasn't to be trusted, and that was that. She returned to the door, then looked back at him, as he shrugged his outer shirt on and zipped it up. I hope to core you know what you're doing, and I hope you figure out whatever it is you're going through, she said. Without waiting for response, she left him there alone. 10. His first duty as a reinstated officer to the Sovereign Coalition had been to procure a better workstation for Zenfor. After studying the schematics of Tempest and making a few inquiries, Cass had been granted the authority to allow Zenfor to work in the weapons control lab adjacent to engineering. It was the perfect solution, as there were rarely any personnel in there, and it gave her enough space to spread out. The only hiccup had been convincing both the captain and Evie she wouldn't take over the weapon systems on the ship and use them against them. But after spending a prolonged period of time with her, Cass realized there was never a danger. Zenfor wasn't threatened by them, in any sense of the word. They were almost like background noise to her, and the only one she really paid any attention to was Commander Sester. The work was going well. It had been nearly sixty days since they left eight, having only stopped twice at Coalition Worlds for minor repairs and restocking. Tepitz was self-sufficient for tens of thousands of light years, but she was still a very new and somewhat experimental ship. Sometimes the advanced engines created unanticipated strains, so occasional stops were necessary. Cass only hoped they'd worked out most of the problems by the time they got beyond Coalition territory, but that was still a good hundred days away. In the meantime, Zenfor's work progressed nicely. She'd already found a way to increase their shielding capabilities by reinforcing not only the magnetic energy that kept things from hitting the ship, but by coating the hull with a new type of cyclax she developed while working in the weapons lab. She'd managed to test it on a few of the ship's darts, the small missiles full of explosive material Coalition forces used when conventional weapons wouldn't do. Chief Master Raffenkel had even stopped by on a few occasions to watch or provide input, hoping to integrate some of the shielding on her Space Wing fighters stationed in Bay 2. Cass couldn't have been more pleased, though there had been one issue about two weeks after she'd begun her work. Sester had expressed some concerns to him about her behavior. Nothing overtly nefarious, but he thought it important enough to inform Cass. The truth was... He would be surprised if Zenfor didn't have some secrets she was keeping from them. She obviously hadn't told them everything about her people, as both she and Maless had been light on the details on the trip back from Koval. But if it was enough of something to get Cesar's attention, it might be a problem. In the interest of fairness, he had decided not to inform Evie or the captain yet. There was no sense in getting everyone worked up over nothing. All he could do was keep a sharp eye on her, and keep the rest of the crew out of her way for the time being. And at the first sign of something wrong, then he'd go to his superiors. Ever since their confrontation in his quarters, Evie had been more standoffish than normal. Thus, she wouldn't be receptive to hearing anything negative about Zenfor from him. She'd been adamant he'd been hiding something from her. But he'd been honest with her, more or less. And now things were... strained... They hadn't spent any time together off-duty ever since that day. She'd given him a few orders, which he assumed were probably tests of his seriousness, which he'd followed to the letter. 
in situations like this, he had learned it was better to keep his head down and not make any waves. This was why he dreaded the imminent daily confrontation. Since she was the officer he reported to, every day he had to prepare and hand-deliver updates on Zenfor's work, and every day the tension between them only increased. He wasn't sure if it was something he was doing or just the fact he was wearing the uniform, but it didn't matter. By now she should be over it, and he was tired of her resenting him for a decision that, so far, had proved to be the right one. Second shift was on when the hypervader doors opened on the bridge, which meant the captain wasn't there and Evie was in command. Cast noticed instead of Lieutenant Uma, Ensign Yamashita was stationed at Tactical. He supposed her skill helping them leave Jatan back when they were being pursued by the Sargans had finally paid off. The only other crew member he knew with any kind of familiarity was Lieutenant Zal, who had been more than interested in Cass when he'd first come aboard. But now that he was a coalition officer again, and a semi-permanent part of the crew, his interest had only increased. Cass had spent more than a few meals with the Untuburu, discussing viewpoints in a variety of different subjects. Though he missed the company of his friend, the first time he'd been to Zal's quarters he'd been so apprehensive he'd roped Evie into coming with him, which had made the night a lot easier. Cass nodded to both Zal and Yamashita as he made his way over to Evie, who sat in the command chair. "'Yes, Commander?' she said in a very sterile tone. "'Daily report, ma'am. Senfor has informed me she is close to finishing a new type of ammunition we can load into the outer guns. They should provide three times the explosive yield.' Evie held out her hand, and Cass deposited a long bar into it. She tapped the edge of the bar, and a screen flickered to life, suspended in midair from the bar. She scrolled through the information, then turned it off, handing it back to him. Very good. Carry on. She hadn't even looked at him. Cass turned to resume his duties, but caught sight of Zal and stopped. The Untuburu only stared at him with his typical smile. Cass was fed up and this had gone on long enough. Commander, he said, keeping his voice just above a whisper. She didn't respond other than to cock her head in his direction. Perhaps once our duty shifts are over, you'd like to catch a meal? I could. That would be inappropriate, she snapped. A flush swept across his cheeks. Cass retreated back to the hypervader. His first instinct was to argue, but with Evie being his commanding officer, he couldn't openly oppose her, not unless he wanted a formal reprimand or worse. And the last thing he needed was a dark mark on his record. It would do nothing but reinforce the fact he couldn't take it as a coalition officer anymore. Commander, Ensign Cortez said for the helm, we're approaching the XL Nebula. Drop from undercurrent speed and prepare to navigate through, Evie replied without missing a beat. Cass paused before stepping back into the hypervader as the screen slowed to show the view of the gorgeous nebula stretched out before them. It was too large to go around, and undercurrents didn't go through nebulae, so they'd have to take the slow way through. Either that, or add seven extra days to their trip trying to avoid it. But most nebulae were harmless, and it should only take half a day to traverse. Cass couldn't help but take the opportunity to look. It was a magnificent sight, all those blues and reds mixed together in a swirling mass that filled the entire screen. Sir, I'm picking up a distress signal, Yamashita said, but there's a lot of distortion. Captain to the bridge, Evie stood. Saul, can you help her clean it up so we can hear it? Yes, Commander, Saul said, his hard light hands working the controls in front of him. Do you detect where it's coming from? Evie asked. Cass stepped back into the bridge, staying close to the wall and out of her eyeline. I don't detect any ships or spacecraft, Yamashita replied, but her voice wavered. This was the first time Cass had seen her up here. Was this her first day on tactical duty? Commander, Saul interjected, I think I have it. Let's hear it, she replied. This is the USCS Iphigenia, calling any friendly ship in the area. We are stuck in a gravity well and can't find our way out. Please assist. The Iphigenia? Evie furrowed her brow. Why does that name sound familiar? 
She was lost 27 years ago in this sector, Cass replied, stepping forward. One of the few coalition ships lost within coalition space that was never recovered. Evie turned to look at him, but didn't say anything. Confirmed, Zal said. List is being lost on the 38th day of Hecaton in the year 2571. Despite searches of the area, the ship was never found. Evie returned her attention to the screen. So then, why all of a sudden... Report, Captain Green said, entering the bridge through the other hypervader. It seems we found a relic, sir, Evie said, pulling the information up on the screen. Yamashita, have you triangulated where that signal is coming from? The Iphigenia, Green said to himself, rubbing his chin as he read the ship's stats. Not yet, Commander. I can't get a solid lock. It's somewhere ahead of us, Yamashita said. Cass stared at the screen. Was the ship inside the nebula? Surely there's no one left alive. Not after twenty-seven years, Evie said, her attention focused on the captain. Never underestimate the resilience of a coalition crew. With some ingenuity, there might still be a few of them left. I've heard of people surviving up to a year in nothing but an escape pod, Green replied. She didn't respond, but her face had gone a shade of pale Cass hadn't seen before. She returned to her seat, but her gaze remained focused on the screen ahead of them. Cass moved over beside her. Are you okay? Fine, she croaked. Is there something you need? No, I just... Then return to your duties. Got it, Yamashita said. Helm, point us at heading 447 Mark 9. Ensign Cortez nodded, and the screen switched views. They were looking at the edge of the nebula, but right along the rim was an area devoid of stars. It looked like a black patch on the screen. Magnify, Green ordered. The black patch doubled in size, taking up most of the screen, but Cass couldn't see anything inside. Anything? Green asked Zal, who had his attention focused on his controls. I still don't detect any ships. But the engine is right. The signal is coming from there, Saul said. Cortez, get us closer, but not too close. Let's see if we can determine if the ship is still there. Green turned to Yamashita. Is that distress call repeating on auto? Yes, sir, she replied. It's probably been on repeat for 27 years, Evie said, some of the color having returned to her face. This may not be the heaviest traffic part of space, but ships come through here all the time. One of them would have picked it up before us, Green said. So why does it only show up now? We're in position, sir, Cortez said. Green turned to his ops officer. So? I'm still not detecting any foreign bodies. But to be honest, I can't determine anything beyond the event horizon. Something is blocking us from scanning deep within. It's like it is invisible to us. Damn. Green said. As much as I'd like to, we don't have time to stick around and uncover this mystery. Anson, notify Coalition Central to send an investigative unit out here to take a look and send them what little data we have. If anyone is still alive out there, they'll have to make it a few more days until another ship can get here. We can't waste time chasing ghosts when we have a real threat to deal with. Aye, Yamashita replied. Cortez, Get us back on track and through the nebula. I want to get back in the undercurrents as soon as possible. Yes, sir, she replied. Evie turned on Cass again, as if only now remembering he was still there. Is there a problem, Commander? Cass grimaced. He'd been so involved in watching the spectacle, he'd ignored what she'd said. No, he replied through gritted teeth. Then I suggest you return to your duties. Evie put additional emphasis on the last word. Cass held her gaze. Yes, ma'am. He returned to the hypervator, not daring to look back at her. Sir? Cortez's voice wavered with uncertainty. Cass was almost back to the hypervator again, and was determined not to look back. He needed to follow orders. I can't seem to move, Cortez said, her face twisted in a grimace. The ship is stuck. <laughs>